as I said, I'm an editor at the Columbia Journalism Review. I've written this book. Uh, I don't know, I haven't, I just arrived in Kiev, so I haven't experienced the, um, the seminar as you guys have. So um, I was going to say, if anyone, does anyone remember Monty Python, the comedy troupe from Britain in the 70s? Well, they used to have a bit, <clears throat> they're, and one of the things they used to say was, and now for something completely different. And that's, uh, I hope, what uh, I offer is completely different from uh, things you've been, uh, you've been doing. Because I'm trying to offer a different perspective on the news. So I want to talk about this book. Um, it's about, it's, uh, as you can see, I'm sorry about this. Uh, I'm walking back and forth in front of it. It's, uh, as you can see, it's called the, uh, the Watchdog That Didn't Bark. The Financial Crisis and the Disappearance of Investigative Reporting. And we're going to be talking about um, what I think was missing from business news in the pre-crisis uh, era, which I define as 2000 to 2008. Afterward, actually, I'd like to talk to everyone, all of you, about how you experience the crisis yourselves, whether or not that the events of September 2008, the, the collapse of Lehman Brothers and American International Group and the rest, is that, whether that's something familiar to you, whether that had an impact immediately um, in Ukraine or, or, or globally, but it certainly was a seminal event in the financial history of the United States. I think in world history, too. So what I'm going to talk about was, um, I think one of the... the, the the main concept I want to talk about, the main element that we need to deal with as journalists, was the concept of surprise. Um, September 15, 2008, caught everyone by surprise, the press included. Now, you'll, you'll hear some protestations that, that that's not true, that we were all over it, stuff like that. And in some, some extent, there's, there's some mitigation there. Certainly, um, Everyone knew, I think, again, you're all business reporters, so I'm assuming, I'm, I'm assuming a couple things. One is that I'm not talking too fast. If I am, you should definitely wave at me. Talking too fast, good. Okay. One that, you know, you're kind of understanding what I'm saying. If you aren't, seriously, just talk to me. I mean, just, we'll, we'll go, just, we'll just do a different thing. But also that you, you're business reporters, you have, you, you have basic understanding of, of, um, of the events that I'm talking about. Um, really, it's not rocket science. You know, in, in September 2008, essentially the United States financial system was on the brink of collapse. This, the U.S. financial system, of course, underpins the global financial system. And all of those Wall Street names that everyone, I think, is familiar with, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, Maryland, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, whatever, all of these global banks, uh, HSBC, um, Royal Bank of Scotland, you name it. Um, heretofore, pre previously they, they were pillars of, of, of the world economy and all powerful. And then in a blink of an eye, they were essentially... Uh, insolvent and in desperate need of government support. And literally it happened overnight. So what happened? <clears throat> what was missing? And this, I think, again, as, as journalists, right, it's the surprise that we have, to, we have to think about. The public was surprised and the press was surprised. What was missing? Okay, so here's this book. And I'm going to run through the chapters <clears throat> essentially because it's, the book is about 365 pages, but it's essentially one argument. And I'm going to try and discuss what, a, again, what was missing. And when I say the watchdog that didn't bark, um, that presupposes that there is such a thing as a watchdog, right? That the media, the press, the business press particularly,
has a role to play in policing the financial system. Now, um, I don't know um, the traditions. I know your your press is is independent media is young, and you're just sort of forming your own traditions now, and you're trying to find your your way. But um, maybe this will be helpful because in the U.S. Um, our our press isn't. I'm not holding it up as a model for anything, or we're so great, or whatever. However, um, there are elements of the U.S. American press that is great, and that are um, that are quite old, and maybe offer sort of a interesting path for for Ukraine. Okay, I think you all um, read the introduction. If you haven't, don't worry about it. Um, but essentially what I'm trying to do with this book is set up a couple of polarities. Um, two opposing ideas. And I'm suggesting in, in the introduction and throughout the book that um, journalism in the U.S., but I think around the world, right, can be separated into a couple of general approaches. One is access, one is accountability. It's just different ways of going about this business. And I'm not trying to make any value judgments, but I am suggesting that, it, that, and as I think my book tries to demonstrate anyway, what I'm suggesting is that these two approaches to your job present entirely different representations of reality. And I'm going to try and explain what I'm talking about as I go. And Ty, I'm counting on you to tell me if I'm being heard or talking too fast or anything like that. So if you read the introduction, um, again, I break down the field. And I, I talk about this because in the U.S., um, these two approaches have been fighting each other for about 100 years. Um, and it's natural. I mean, that that there should be conflict within the field of journalism is absolutely appropriate. It, it's, just, it's just part of you know, the, the dynamic of, of a vital and, 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 and um, competitive field. But some people will make a living trying to uh, get information from powerful people and institutions. That's basically access reporting. The other set of people will be trying to hold those very same people to account for what they do. So you can sort of think about it in two different ways. The, on the access side, reporters are trying to, will tell you what the powerful people are saying. And on the accountability side, reporters will tell you what powerful people are doing. I really break it out and don't take any notes or whatever. It's not, this is, there's been no quiz, but I just want to, I um, can't really read it very well. It doesn't, doesn't matter. I mean, these are really simple ideas. I didn't mean to pretend that this is some kind of, this is scientific or, or particularly complex or even particularly original. Uh, the, the opening of my book is a, a quote from 1920 where a great journalist, journalistic thinker named Walter Lippmann is saying he's, he's starting, he's, he's talking about uh, journalism of his era, but he's basically saying, he says in this paragraph, it's like, I'm not saying anything that isn't already the shop talk or talked about in newsrooms around the country. This is something reporters and editors already know. So I'm not claiming that I'm doing anything particularly original. This is something that reporters and editors have been talking about for basically 100 years. However, I thought, I think, I thought it was useful for me to sort of break it down. Because as we go through this book and as we talk about uh, reporting during the financial crisis, I don't think you can really understand it. I don't think you can, I don't think you can really read it without understanding this polarity, okay? So anyway, access is 
got some traits, accountability just some others. And again, I used to be an access reporter too. I mean, I've done plenty of reporting trying to get powerful people to talk to me. That's, I was at the Wall Street Journal for eight years. That's what you do. But I've done the other as well. Um, but the point, I think what you need to just sort of think about is when you're talking about access reporting, um, you're talking about your sources are elites. And when you're talking about accountability reporting, your sources are dissidents. Do you see what, how, how, how this goes? If you're talking to elite sources, your reporting will tend to transmit orthodox views. If you're talking to dissidents, you will probably be transmitting heterodox dissident views, right? That's just logical. Um, I call access reporting top down. I call accountability reporting bottom up. Um, in terms of business reporting, um, the audience that business reporters typically have in mind is uh, investors. And again, there's nothing wrong with, at all, with serving the interests and needs of investors. Because you're talking about, as opposed to who, I mean, you're talking about as opposed to management of a company, and investors are important, and they don't have a lot of, often don't have a lot of power. But I'm suggesting in my book that uh, the investor focus can be also very narrow. And it's precise, it can be precisely the wrong, the wrong perspective, depending on the situation. And sometimes a broader perspective is needed. And that um, accountability re reporting, almost by definition, uh, is trying to serve the public interest. What's the public? What is the public interest? I mean, that's a a question that philosophers have been debating for a long time. But I think all of us can intuitively understand that um, there is a broad collective interest of society as a whole, as opposed to individual uh, private interests and niches. So for instance, just for instance, the um, Interests of Citigroup investors, Citigroup is a, one of the largest banks in the world, a key player in the financial collapse. Um, one of the worst actors that um, we had in um, the pre-crisis era and the biggest recipient of government help in 2008-9. My point here only is that the interests of investors in Citigroup shares were entirely opposed to the interests of the public as to what Citigroup was up to. We'll get to that in a second. But I hope I, I just wanted to explain the, the, the basic thing. Another piece of this, um, just from journalist, journalistic, sort of narrow journalistic perspective, the the different styles, approaches to journalism also call for different forms and different practices for us as reporters. And uh, I, I say inverted pyramid in storytelling, but just to sort of give you an idea, um, inverted pyramid is this technical journalism term that just talks about a, a brief article that packs all of the relevant information at the very top. And it's inverted because the less important thing comes next and the third most important thing comes third, fourth, fifth, and sixth until, until, you, until you're done with the story. But essentially all the important stuff's at the top. It's very, very functionalistic. Um, whereas accountability reporting generally can't do that. Reason being that um, often it's, it's taking on extremely complex subjects. Like, for instance, the global financial system. And to do that, you're not, a, you're not going to be able to just pack you know, the whole, all of the information in the first paragraph and, 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 go and, and do it in this kind of newswire functionalistic way. How do you do it? You have to tell a story. That's what we do, right? You have to, you have to lay out context and prepare the reader 
draw them in, and take them through the problem. And that's, that's the difference. So these are two, again, don't, uh, do, you know, don't get too bogged down in, in the graphic or whatever, but these are two very different um, uh, approaches to journalism. And as we'll see, uh, uh, they can produce completely different representations of what, what's going on in, in a particular situation, like, for instance, um, the financial system. Okay, so what I do, this book is uh, historically uh, based, so what I'm trying to explain is that that polarity that I'm talking about has been around since the get-go. From the beginning, the first, <laughs> the first journalist ever to write down um, stuff on a, on a notepad, we're doing things in completely different ways. So what I try to do is I talk, I go back to the early 20th century, and um, I talk about a, um, there were, back in that early 20th century, um, I'm going to skip ahead here because I want to show you something. Okay. All right. Back in the early 20th century, what did we have? We had a big, you know, in the early 20th century in the U.S., what do you have? We had oligarchs. Now, I'm not saying we don't have oligarchs today, but we had, we had real ones back then. And um, they, just individual men, controlled um, entire industries. Uh, copper, sugar, beef, and oil. Um, and this was the fellow who did it. Now, John D. Rockefeller um, owned something called the Standard Oil Company, and it controlled 90% of the... Um, oil market in the United States. In fact, it left 10% just so, you know, it would just give the appearance that somebody else was competing with them, but they really weren't. So anybody who wanted any factory, any, any home, uh, eventually autos and stuff, had, were dependent on, on this fellow. And of course, as you probably are aware, I mean, once oligarchs become entrenched, they're difficult to remove. And also they tend to uh, expand their influence, including into politics. So with a handful of other um, folks, the oligarchs essentially control the political process of the United States. Again, I'm not saying it's that different today, but I am saying that it, it was, it, back in the day it was extreme. Okay, what do you do? So you're the, uh, you're the journalist, and I want you guys to sort of think about this because we're going to come back to this problem in the Ukrainian context. I'm suggesting that there were two approaches to journalism, really and only two. Um, okay. The first was, uh, approach was taken by the muckrakers. Muckrakers are um, a class of reporters that were born in this era, essentially to try to um, cope with problems that had become extremely complex and extremely dangerous for American democracy. The problems were monopoly, industrial consolidation. And um, there were a handful of people who were trying to figure out a new journalism form to deal with it. Like, how do we, how do, we do this? And the thing about Rockefeller and Standard Oil was it wasn't like any like it wasn't like no one knew who he was. Everyone knew who Rockefeller was. And in fact, he had been investigated by various branches of government for 30 years. There had been books written about him, and newspaper articles had his name in it every day. And yet, and yet, no one could, nothing could be done about his grip on this key sector of the American economy. So Ida Tarbell was this uh, woman, 43 years old at the time she started this. Very unusual person. Um, you could see from her dress, this is Victorian uh, era. And um, back in the day, yes, it was very unusual for women to be anything, particularly reporters. And um, I, 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 I'm very fond of this, this 
person. Her, her work's just unbelievable. But she had to do, you know, made in, incredible sacrifices to do it. One thing she did was she never, um, she very, very consciously decided never to have a family, never to marry. Because she knew she had, you know, she had to choose. And this is the life she, she chose. So in the early 20th century, they were trying to figure out, oh, how do we, what do we, how do we, you know, we, you know, the, like I said, the issue of monopoly was everywhere. That was the, the topic of the day. What do we do? You know, how do we attack it? She worked <coughs> with a, a guy named Sam McClure, and he was this kind of crazy genius. And uh, also, uh, you, know, you know, an uh, unusual fellow, outsider. He started this magazine called McClure's. And um, McClure's is, was a, uh, you know, it, it started as this sort of literary journal in the, late, in, the, in, late, in, the, in the 1890s. But he recruited really first-class writers. And Ida Tarbell was the first one. And Ida Tarbell was... Um, you know, really a historian, she really had no investigative reporting experience. But again, my point was that at that point, they realized, everyone, everyone at McClure's recognized that the issue of trusts, they called it, monopolies are called trusts in the U.S. The issue of monopoly was unavoidable. So, so they launched uh, this project. And, you know, this is the cover of the book. It's two volumes, you know. And this um, this investigation called it was called the history of the Standard Oil Company, and it was originally planned as a three part series, and it originally came out in 1903, and the public was just like stunned to see like the what it essentially did was it it went all the way back to the beginning of the Standard Oil Company, and just started from the beginning and walked readers through how 30 years before this company had founded. And how exactly it, 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 it um, was able to capture the entire U.S. oil market. Um, you have to read my book to kind of get the details of how she did it. But essentially, this was a very courageous work. Rock of, uh, Standard Oil was at that time probably the most powerful corporation on the face of the earth. John Rockefeller was... Um, Obviously, one of the most powerful people. And he wasn't talking to her, you know. He was not talking to her. So uh, they had no idea, like, what he would do. And everyone was very nervous about it. And McClure's was this small entrepreneurial magazine, very fragile. And, you know, the, there was a lot of tension. What's important about this particular work is that um, isn't, you know, it had a lot of impact. One of the things it did was it, it, it was completed in, 2000, in 1904 and, a couple, and it basically was laid the groundwork for an important lawsuit that the U.S. government brought against Standard Oil and broke it up. Essentially, it, it smashed the monopoly. So with wor you know, the written word, power of the pen. But really what was more important for our purposes, I think, is that this work was captured the public's imagination. And so they originally planned a three-part series, and then they had to expand it to seven, and then it was 12, and finally it was 19 parts. And they turned it into a book, two volumes. The circulation of this magazine soared. Ida Tarbell became a national hero. Remains in the journalism pantheon today. But what's important is not so much that she wrote something, the government filed a lawsuit, and defeated Standard Oil. It's a very crude way of putting it anyway. What's important is that she was able to reach and, 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 and touch an, the, the, the public in a way that, that appealed to their sense of you know, moral outrage, but also to their intelligence. All she said was, here's what happened. I'm going to explain this thing from start to finish. And this, this work, if you read it, if you read my book, you'll see the work is very um, dry. It's very sober. It's f basically a compendium of facts, one piled one on top of the other. And of course, she's a great writer, and 
she's able to marshal these facts in a way that that um, um, you know that had that had some force. But the point was that she wasn't. Um, this is not a polemic. It was not propaganda. This was journalism, and it was investigative report, reporting, basically being invented, <clears throat> and um, and it worked. You know, that, that's the important thing. Okay, the reason I go back to this era is that um, I want to set up this polarity that goes through the century. Because again, it's eternal. And, 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 and I think it's universal. Maybe you'll recognize it in your own country, in your own field. We can talk about that. <laughs> anyway, this guy, Clarence Barron, was this 400-pound uh, press baron who um, who bought this paper, and in the early 20th century, the uh, Wall Street Journal was a very um, narrow publication, specifically for um, for um, uh, investors. Its circulation was 10,000. McClure's was 500,000. And in the, in the U.S. was very small, was much smaller back then. So 500,000 was bigger than the New York Times is today. So, uh, and his sources were elites. You may recognize this one. Um, what he did was uh, Barron put a huge uh, premium on um, interviewing powerful people. In fact, uh, after he died, they published two memoirs and they were called, They Told Barron. In other words, what he did was use his social, high social rank to gain interviews with folks like, like the Tsar and the Kaiser and, um, and guys like this. <laughs> this guy is uh, the head of something called uh, National City Bank in the 1920s. That's the predecessor to Citigroup. And he was responsible, I mean, historians have basically agree on this. He was res largely one of the most the prime agents of this. This was the, uh, the crash of 1929, which led to this. So my only point with this chapter is that um, it's called, sorry guys, I have to put my glass on. It's called Access and Messenger Boys, The Roots of Business News and the Birth of the Wall Street Journal. Basically, my point here is that Wall Street Journal, you know, essentially, first of all, had nothing to do with, um, it was incapable of confronting uh, bi conventional business reporting at, in its foundation, you know, its roots. Was incapable of doing anything like what the muckrakers did. And... Um, or, or understanding what this guy was up to a, little, a couple decades later. Because it was, you know, it was focused on its narrow mission of trying to get information from the top and serving investors. All I'm trying to say is um, that it was from the very beginning this kind of... Um, this kind of polarity has, has, been, has been around. And it's, again, it's not a problem. It's just something that we need, as journalists, we need to think about as we go forward. OK. Um, the rest of the book uh, is uh, trying to describe I, the next couple chapters. OK, I'm going to just go back to it. Next couple chapters, it's called one, the next one is essentially how, what I'm, what I'm saying is, though, is that, you know, this access thing uh, and messenger function um, is not business news, is not business news. That's just its roots, its core. Over the next couple of, uh, over, the cent over, the, over the next couple of chapters and over the course of the 20th century, what I'm saying is business news came of age, you know. It, it, it actually was able to incorporate the muckraking function within mainstream institutions. This is the important thing. Uh, 
don't worry about this one too much, but there's a great editor at the Wall Street Journal in the 40s and 50s named Barney Kilgore. What he did was he kind of ripped up the Wall Street Journal, which was basically about to fold, fail. And he, he clear, what he did was essentially empowered reporters. That's the way I sort of think about it. He gave them the most precious thing you can give a reporter, which is time. Time to look into things, time to go deep on subjects, time to understand complex situations. And he, he completely changed the architecture of the paper. Um, the paper, when he, 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 the paper when he took it over, I like to think of it as sort of CNBC on print. If you know what CNBC is, it's a, 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 it's a, a business news channel that just throws information at you constantly. What he did was he cleared out the front page and left two spaces on either side of the page for long form stories. And every day there would be two of those. And each day, each, each story would look in depth at some issue. Either it's economic, corporate, markets, or something. But the point is he um, enabled journalists to step back from the day-to-day -day flurry of news and also to to, to, to stop um, relying entirely on powerful institutions for material. With time, reporters can develop their own stories, develop their own original reporting. You know, this, this, we, we kind of take this for granted, but it wasn't always the case. Someone had to do it. And, and what's, what's important about Kilgore and the Wall Street Journal is when he took it over, as I said, the paper was about to fold in the 1940s. By the time he died in 1967, it was one of the most powerful papers in the country. And in, by the 70s, it was the most, obviously, the global financial leader and the most popular newspaper in the United States. Point being only that when you, repeat, re, when you, when you respond to readers' intelligence and give them great journalism, they'll reward you. The next chapter is just a discussion about uh, U.S. journalism history, but I think it might be relevant here because um, I'm arguing that in the 60s, um, all of those muckraking functions that Ida Tarbell and her friends pioneered in the early 20th century were essentially brought into mainstream media. Now, um, people will uh, argue with this thing. A lot of people um, will tell you mainstream media is um, lame or corrupt or complicit and um, generally useless. And I'm arguing that's actually not the case. Um, of course, that's true in many cases. But I think it's really important to remember uh, for everybody that um, there is a line of work that stretches back a long way that really was um, powerful and independent and, um, and effective in holding power to account. And, and it just can't be dismissed by saying, oh, mainstream media is lame. My point is that people had to fight very hard, you know, to get accountability reporting incorporated into major news organizations. And when I'm saying major, I mean the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, CBS News, and again, your equivalents. The point is, is that um, it's important that, um, you know, it's great to have alternative, the alternative press and left-wing press or right-wing press or whatever it is attacking from the margins. But, you know, the great the most powerful journalism comes from the center of the journalism culture. And if, what I'm arguing for is that at the center should be this form of reporting that Ida Tarbell pioneered. And I'm, uh, all I'm saying is, if you read chapter four, all I'm saying is you can't deny that this was the case in the U.S. in the end of the 20th century. There was my only point is there was a watchdog, and the watchdog was, was powerful. Okay. 
like I said, um, you know, I'm not going to walk you through the whole thing, but um, there, um, things changed in the 90s. I mean, and then things really changed in the 2000s. Um, I argue in chapter 5 that um, there was a huge interest in the stock market in the U.S. in the 90s. There was a big bull market. And I don't know if you remember, some of you are not old enough, but tech companies were the rage. Uh, uh, Amazon.com and all these new companies were new and they were exploding uh, in value. And the public became very you know, interested in the stock market. After, um, after the crash of 1929, Wall Street and the stock market were essentially discredited. It took like 50 years, but eventually people started to respond and get back into stocks and were interested in it. And the business press, I'm arguing, responded by giving it much more investor-oriented news and oriented toward gaining access to powerful people. One of the main, one of the main um, things that people were interested in were mergers and acquisitions because stocks jump you know, to, in, 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 uh, move in, in significant ways, usually up on the announcement of a murder, merger. And so I'm arguing in this chapter that news organizations really turn their attention <laughs> to trying to get access to, to the powerful people and, and left by the wayside their watchdog function. Does anyone know this channel, CNBC? Because it's like the CNN of business news, but I think it's much more um, U.S.-centric and maybe... Point is, this is a, an investor channel. And um, it delivers a form of news that resolutely will look only at what institutions are telling it. It has no independent kind of capability for looking at wider systemic problems. And it sort of, to me, it's a symbol of one form of reporting and what happens when, what happens when, um, when the balance gets shifted too far toward, um, toward access reporting. Okay. The trouble was, for our purposes, the trouble with this trend in business news is that in the early 90s, something else was going on below the surface, and it was the rise of something called subprime. Does anyone know what subprime mortgages are? Subprime mortgages, a mortgage is, you know, a loan on a house. And a subprime lo loan is a loan to someone with bad credit or someone who, for some reason, is deemed to be um, a riskier bet. The subprime industry in the U.S., it's, a, it's like any lending market. At the one end, there'll be rich people who will get loans for, for a lot of, for, for, uh, on good terms. And at the other end of the market, there'll be poor people who will be dealing with... It's a very tough area. Uh, in the U.S., it's always been a very, very tough market because these are usually desperate people who can't get money anywhere else and need it for some reason. And the industry that's set up to serve them is, uh, is, uh, is, can be very abusive. I mean, I assume that that's the case here and everywhere else. Well, the subprime loan industry started to rise in the 1990s. And if you don't know, I'll tell you, subprime loans were at the heart of the global financial crisis. Um, as you sort of make your way through your um, through your careers, this is a you know this is sort of a um, I, I'd encourage you to sort of get your arms around sort of the basics of the financial crisis because um, it's something that happens once every hundred years, and um, it's something that. Uh, 
that you kind of need to understand about what happens when um, what happens when a sector of the economy goes out of control, the damage it can do, and that's certainly what happened with with the financial sector, and the reason was subprime. This chapter is called Subprime Rises in the 1990s, Journalism and Regulation Fight Back. What happened was, in the, in the 90s, this industry started to rise, mostly because people were broke, and there were problems with, um, we had a recession in the early 90s. Um, and you, as, as economics reporters, you may know, um, the U.S. Um, has not done well for the last 30 years by the middle class. And so where, where our, um, the public's debts were rising and banks were sort of taking advantage of this by lending people at very high rates of interest. And what was important was the journalism was very important player in trying to keep this ind industry under control. And I say journalism and regulation because um, those two things actually work together. They don't um, cooperate. But there's a dynamic between effective re regulation and investigative reporting that helps police markets. Um, and again, I I know a little about Ukraine, and I want to hear about it, but I, I know governance is a problem, you know. Well, not, and it clearly was a problem in our country, too. But what happens, what happens was, you know, there is such a thing as effective regulation, and it does have an impact, and journalism works with it. By exposing wrongdoing, regulators step in. Or regulators bring a case and journalism brings attention to it. And a dynamics begins where, where abuses within a sector of the economy are held in check. It's exactly what happened in the 90s. If you read my book, you'll find out. But what happened was, you know, journalists started to look at problems in, on the street. You know, People were losing their homes. And they were getting stuck with these mortgage products that um, essentially were, were, were debt traps for them. What they found was that when they looked, at, looked into the problem, it wasn't just the street corner lender who was giving some poor guy a hard time, but that the small lenders were actually backed by big national banks. Eventually they would be backed by Wall Street. What happens is Wall Street or a big national bank will, will fund the small lender and once the loan is made they'll buy the loan back and sell it on international markets as a mortgage-backed security. Again, I'm kind of assuming you guys know what a security is, you know what a bond is, you know what a mortgage is. If you don't, just let me know. But the idea is, I think you can get the picture. These small transactions were being bundled together, sold overseas to countries around the world. And this transaction is at the heart, this, this subprime transaction is at the heart, uh, an underlaid, basically would come to underlay the global financial system. Now, I introduced a couple of journalists in, in, into the book. Uh, I wish I had his photo, but actually a friend of mine named Mike Hudson. He starts, he's writing for a local paper, you know, small regional paper in Virginia. And he notices that there's all these problems with people and their loans. And this is the early 90s. And it turns out that he's writing about subprime loans. And he's really just kind of figuring out what, what's going on. So he's writing these long stories about, wow, these, these, uh, these, uh, these, this industry is really abusive and these products are really bad and the loans are failing all the time. Again, this is way back. Right? And through the 90s, you know, this kind of dynamic, journalists and regulation and public involvement was able to keep subprime in check. Okay, 
Now we get to the mortgage era. This is the, um, um, these last three chapters. Okay. Uh, the mortgage era is uh, what I call the mortgage era. So the, that's the thing that, um, that's the period in which the global financial crisis was created. Uh, it starts in 2000 and it goes to uh, the end of 2000, basically mid-2007. Um, I say 2006, but you could, and the reason I say that is uh, it was during this period that subprime rises from this teeny thing to this basically the center of the global financial system. And what was, what was maddening to people who knew about subprime, like the reporters who were dealing with it back then, was they knew that this was a rotten business from the beginning. And, you know, and it's okay for business to be rotten and be on the margins. It's not okay for it to be at the center of the financial system, which it became to be. So what you see was this. Uh, you get this. Um, <laughs> this is the financial sector. This is U.S. manufacturing. And this is like, this is the 90s, where basically the backdrop to all this is the rise of the U.S. financial sector. Something you'd think the business press would be on top of. But they weren't. Essentially, we're looking at Wall Street here. And um, why this all happened was, is another question. Here are the banks. Notice the dates. Okay. Notice also um, that they haven't stopped growing, by the way, uh, even after the crash, which was here. But Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, these are all our things. But what was happening here, essentially, was this beginning of financialization. And, and I, the mortgage era starts here. And this was, this was the period where, where essentially Wall Street earnings were based on the subprime business. Here's subprime. And now, this is where I'm writing about in chapter six where the journalism is fighting away. Da, da, da. And I'm not saying, and as you notice, you know, this is not small. It's $100 billion. But it's not this either, right? And it was during this period um, where I found, this is chapter, uh, uh, I lost track of my chapters. Yeah, chapter 7. 2000, 2003. Best journalism's here. Now, I'm not saying there's a, um, you know, parallel or whatever, that the, the one caused, that one held this other in check. I am saying, though, that there was, ex there was as, this, as this chapter tries to demonstrate, there was enormous flurry of activity, journalistic, regulatory, every other thing, around subprime mortgages in this era. You have to read the book to, to, to extent, understand the extent of it. But this was, my point is, we haven't even got to the problem yet. But we're already on top of it. You know, what, that's what the frustrating thing about, that's sort of the uh, irony or the paradox or something. The big problematic of, uh, of for journalism is that the best journalism was done here. And it was done in concordance with, with regulation. And what I'm saying in chapter uh, 9 is, chapter 9 is called, The Watchdog That Didn't Bark, The Disappearance of Accountability Reporting and the Financial Collapse, 2004 to 2006. It's a little hard to convey, but this is insane. I'm just, I'm letting you know. Uh, subprime mortgages were um, a business that had always been confined, and before here it was down here, had always been confined to the absolute margins of society. You had to be really desperate, really desperate to, um, 
to take out a subprime loan. Why? Because if you can pay 4%, why would you pay 7? And if you could pay, if you, if you could get a fixed rate, why would you buy something that had a 7% now and 13% later? Et cetera, et cetera. These were products that were dangerous on their face and really never should have been sold. And yet, this number is 625 billion right here. If you add all this together, that's like two and a half trillion dollars. But that's not the worst, you know, that's just part of it, right? Look at this. Does anyone know what a collateralized debt obligation is? Again, center of the um, global financial crisis. And um, what's interesting about this product, a CDO is made by bundling the worst, oops, the worst of these. You take the worst of the worst and you, you, you bundle them into security and it was called a collateralized debt obligation. And you may have heard that this was the product that was rated AAA by Standard & Poor's and these rating agencies and accounting firms valued them at, uh, you know, 100 cents on the dollar. Point is, if you really want to know what happened in, um, in 2008, you know, that's it. So what this did was essentially you've got, you know, this huge trillion, you've basically got a, almost $2 trillion worth of securities made from uh, these loans that were essentially corrupt in the first place. This is the only thing I'm trying to get across here is that, um, you know, people talk about the global financial crisis as this enormously complex event, right? And I guess in some ways it certainly was. And if we want, we can talk about, we can talk about, um, you know, the causes. And I would say, though, as business partners, you need to know. You, you, need to, you need to be have at least a passing familiarity with what causes. And, you know, there's lots of theories about it, right? I mean, there's, um, there were trade imbalances. China and, and India were, 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 were rising. There was enormous amounts of cash in the world. Interest rates were really low. Alan Greenspan had them really low. So that people needed um, some place to put this cash, right? And you couldn't put them in U.S. Treasuries anymore because interest rates were like 1%. So what did you do? You bought a CDO. CDOs paid whatever they paid, depending on, depending on what, which, how much risk you wanted to take on. But they might pay 3% or they might pay 4% or maybe, maybe even 5 But what was the CDO based on, right? CDO was based on, whoops, Oops, I gave away my punchline. It was based on this. It was based on this stuff, and this stuff was the stuff that was the individual tra transaction between a homeowner and a lender. And essentially, what I'm arguing in the book was um, these were all defective products. So, um, and what I'm saying here really is that throughout the mortgage period, right, there were reporters who understood what was, what was going on and were reporting about it. The trouble was they didn't work for mainstream business publications. This is a, uh, this is a um, muckraking book that I write about. It was, uh, it was written by a guy named Richard Lord, who worked for an alternative paper in Pittsburgh, which is a small, you know, it's a medium-sized city. Published in 2004, right? So check the date. Here. All right, here. All right, here. Okay. But still, not here. And 
I talk about Richard Lord, I talk about Mike Hudson, others who had seen the financial system from the ground up and knew that they weren't they may not have known what a CDO was either, okay? I admit collateralized debt obligation is a very sophisticated product. <clears throat> no one knew what those were. And you guys I'm sure also don't know what a credit default swap is. But essentially that's a that's a bet against these also many multi trillion dollar market also crashed. What my point is this, if you understood what the nature of a subprime mortgage was, if you understood from the ground up what was going on between lender and borrower, you knew this was a problem. And you would write something like this, right? I mean, that's my only point. And there were people who were writing stuff like this. Now, American Nightmare is an interesting book. It's, um, it's uh, I, I call it a muckraking book because it's kind of a mess, right? It's, it's, uh, it, there's no index, there's no footnotes. But this guy, Richard Lord, this is an interesting guy. He, he's writing for an alternative paper. And he's talking to people, and he goes to City Hall, and he looks at foreclosure records, and they're like skyrocketing. And he looks around the country and sees the same thing is true. Mostly it's in inner cities, African Americans, blacks, who are the targets of subprime lenders. And I'm talking about 2001, 2002. And there's data, there's the stories he has to, he was writing at the time. And he's going, what's, you know, what's going on in this, what's going on? And so check it out, he's a young guy, he poses as a student to get into the University of Pittsburgh library, goes on to a Bloomberg terminal. Do you guys know what a Bloomberg terminal is? Bloomberg is a financial data provider. They have a very sophisticated to terminal that costs a fortune. And very few people can afford it. It costs 2000 a month. But you can get any, any bit of financial data, data you could possibly want. They're absolutely magical machines. They're very difficult to learn how to use. Richard Lord teaches himself how to use a Bloomberg terminal. It has a special keyboard, two screens, this whole thing. He has to sit there, figure it out. And he's able to, to trace these, you know, what, basically what happens to subprime mortgages and where they go. And basically where they go is into the, into the global financial system as, as these bonds that I'm talking about. So he writes about it. Like four people read this book. I mean, no one read this book. And um, there's a great passage in there. Um, maybe I'll find it for you. Uh, oh. Yeah. See, he's been talking to people from the you know, in their living rooms, you know, and they're, and they're t explaining, yeah, I didn't know what this mortgage was, and now I'm, I'm bankrupt. So he writes this. He goes, I mean, I don't know if this will work for you guys, but let's try it. He goes, by its very nature, the mortgage-backed securities market encourages lenders to make as many loans at as high an interest rate as possible. You understand why that's true, right? Like, I'm lending you money, and then you're going you're gonna to give me a loan. But I'm not going to keep this loan. I'm going to sell it to Wall Street, and it's going to be sold to the Kia uh, treasurer, because these were bought around the world. So you're, the, the Kia Transportation Pension Fund probably owned you know, CDOs, probably owned some of these securities. So he says... The, the mortgage-backed securities market encourages lenders to make as many loans as as high as interest rate as possible. Why? Because I give you a loan. You, you, you know, I, I give you money. You give me this loan. I sell it. I've already made my money. It's gone. Now the loan's somebody else's problem. So I'm encouraged to make as many of these loans as possible. That was, that's why this happened. Like everyone, everyone was selling these. Oops. Everyone was selling these. 
which were being made into these. And everyone was making money on every transaction. And they were going dispersed around the globe, again, to the Kiev pension. And no one had any risk. It was gone. They just had the fees. So that's what he's trying to, this is, this is what this city reporter was, was learning in 2004. He goes, that may seem a prescription for a frenzied and irresponsible lending. But he goes, but basically federal regulation can keep it in check for, for prime mortgages. People who are, you know, middle class, who can understand a little bit about the thing and aren't desperate for money. But he goes, those breaks don't apply as well in the subprime lending market where regulation is looser, marketing more freewheeling, and customers less savvy. In other words, where there's no regulation, where the customers are desperate, and where the firms are, um, are unethical. Anyway, voila. And this is a that wasn't alone, of course. There was other, other types of reporting, but essentially, it wasn't. Um, it was. It was. It, it disappeared from the mainstream business press. And what you got, it was this kind of stuff. Um, this is a uh, Jamie. D He's a banker. He runs uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, and. Um, New CEO Jamie Dimon wants to mip, whip J.P. Morgan into shape. So I'm not going to go on much longer, but I think it's important to understand what I'm talking about when we're looking at reporting from an investor-only point of view. So I'm going to quote from a piece um, about Citigroup, my least favorite bank. So this is me writing about, this is me from, from one of the chapters. This is the chapter about Watchdog Did not Bark. In October 2006, Business Week, I assume you're familiar with this magazine, ran a story on the mega bank that criticized it for its stock, perform, stock price performance in recent years, noting that Citigroup lags behind banking rivals Bank of America, and J.P. Morgan Chase, and investment banks such as Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs. More acquisitions are urged. The following paragraph illustrates how far the business press discourse had strayed into financial services industry logic. Quote, By all accounts, Citigroup is still a profit powerhouse. Earnings surged to $24.6 billion dollars last year, a 37% jump since December, $24 billion net income. But almost half the company's businesses are under pressure to find new sources of growth, and recent investments have yet to pay off. Moreover, despite $16.8 billion in stock buybacks and $14 billion in dividend payouts, you don't have to know what those are, it's just a lot of money. The stock has hovered at around $50, $50 a share. Since Prince's appointment, this is the CEO, in October 2003, shares are up just 6.8% versus 35% for the S&P 500 Financials Index, Bank of America Corp., which is a rival, with $248 billion in total market value, is quickly closing in on number one city whose stock is worth $252 billion. Okay. So what I'm trying to say there is, as I say, as I write, the story is unassailable from a business journalism perspective. And perhaps that's the problem, right? From a moral perspective, in hindsight, it's a disaster. And the reason is, if you have profits of $24 billion, just to put that in perspective, that was probably the biggest profit of any company in the history of public companies. 24 billion is serious money. Um, no one's seen profits like that before, and they really haven't since. So there's no perspective whatsoever. 
So if you're urging guys like this to boost their profit margins even further, you're basically fueling this. You know, that's where, that's where the industry, that's where the, the, the business press, I think, is, was most um, complicit, I'd say, in this disaster by saying, no, 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 you got to do better. <laughs> you got to do better. You got to do better. More, 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 you know. And so if, and I'm arguing, you know, if it had this perspective, it would know that this is a problem. That this is a problem. It's not just a moral problem. This is one of those interesting moments in, in, in history which actually happens more than, often, more, more than you think where moral and social problems become a real systemic financial problem. And these were, mortgages were actually hurting individuals, but they're about to hurt the entire world, you know, entire financial, financial system. And that's sort of my thesis. So, I just want to say, you know, as you kind of go through, right, your, go about your business, right? And you know that, and I understand that everyone here has a, a job to do and a career to pursue. And I'm telling you that um, the, um, the perspective that you can offer for investors and is an important one. But I'm also saying that if you confine yourself to that particular perspective, you're probably going to be missing something. And the more interesting stories will be the ones that I think will have. You should keep in mind that there's a wider public perspective. And that's sort of the, the thing. And the only thing I wanted to say is that, finally, is that, so you wondered, so people ask me, so, um, you know, after this, um, have things changed? You know, there's the business press, you know, changed fundamentally. And I, I would like to say yes, but I'm afraid it's not true. And I guess I wanted to, to just sort of leave on this particular, to end on this particular note, is that um, there was a, you know, we still have, um, we still have, um, very powerful um, people who are running big chunks of the economy, including the financial system, but also uh, online retail. One of them is, is Jeff Bezos. He runs something called Amazon.com. And this is a, uh, a cover um, on this month's... Uh, uh, he's basically the John Rockefeller of, <laughs> of, of today. He runs Amazon.com, which is basically controls all of online retail. And you'll see this iconic image is, is of, uh, you know, he was able to, gave this magazine a, uh, an interview, and, and this is the uh, treatment they got him. And so I guess the point is we, um, we still face sort of the same issues that they, that the muckrakers faced 100 years ago. And there's still two approaches to, um, to journalism, and, and, and this obviously represents the access point. And the, the only thing to, now to, to worry about is that guys like this, this, this fellow Bezos just bought the Washington Post. And um, uh, uh, so we, we uh, it's just something to think about that um, uh, our oligarchs are still alive and well, but now they're also... Uh, buying newspapers. Anyway, thanks for uh thanks for listening. That's that's my that's my presentation.